tell you what, they've fallen in love with Scott McLaughlin. I heard them go up a mighty roar when he was interviewed on the big screen shortly before, and they were in full voice yesterday at the back end of that race. Yeah, what we want to have a look at uh, down here, uh, Matty, we've got uh, our thermal camera, our forward-looking infrared camera, which we're going to use throughout the day. Fascinating technology, this. So the guys, they're about to commence their warm-up lap. And what you want to do as a driver here is lay some nice rubber, do a big burnout, uh, and come round and when they grid up, and we'll have a look at that in a minute, you want to line up exactly on that point. And see where they are there now. You can take your front wheels, if you like, right up to the white line. You don't actually have to take your splitter or the piece out the front there behind the white line. You can go further if you like. And it's very hard for the driver because he actually can't see up there to his bottom. Now, watch this on the thermal imaging. There you go. Evidence of uh, the burnout they've done. He'll come around and try and put the car whack straight back over the top of those two marks. So starting grid race number three of the V8 Supercars Championship for 2014. The Clipsal 500 to be determined and Shane Van Gisbergen, last year's winners, got the pole from Jamie Wincup, a winner yesterday. Garth Tand, a great job in the shootout for position three. Rick Kelly, very impressive performance. Jack Daniels racing with an engine change. Mark Winterbottom, then Tim Slade next in the queue, followed by a winner also yesterday, Craig Lowndes and Jason Bright. Lowndes, he won it back in 1999 here. Lee Holdsworth inside the 10 in the Erebus Motorsport V8 entry. That's a fine performance. And position number 10 is uh, Chaz Mostert. Now, a couple of things as you look through the grid here to get onto, boys, in terms of penalties that we need to tidy up from yesterday. One of them on screen there at the moment, Nick Perkat, contact yesterday with Michael Caruso. Careless driving, 25 points be nipped off his championship tally. And also a suspended sentence for Michael Caruso, a careless re-entry. Remember that one down at turn oh, nine, right, and there he is on screen, down. position number 19. And also car number 22, we saw the three-door Commodore of James Courtney earlier in our broadcast. There he is on screen at the moment in the background. And he's also had 25 points nipped away from his championship tally as a result of trying to force a gap down there at turn number four. So there's your full field. It's Robert Dahlgren at the end, and it's Shane Van Gisbergen right at the sharp end. We're with us in qualifying, Robert Dahlgren, the Swede, didn't get a lap done had a problem with that car and it got towed back to pit lane and parked for the rest of the session. So Dahlgren will start from position number 25. That's David Reynolds on board with the Bottle O Ford. Will also be in the cabin of Tim Slade. Great Super Chief Auto Racer. That's one of the Nissans. Caruso. And of Michael Caruso, the Norton Hornet. They found a problem with his car last night in the pedal box in the brake bias adjuster. He couldn't figure out why the brake balance in the car was weird. So now they've got an answer and that's a big relief. Cycling through all the cars that are carrying onboard cameras for you today to bring you all the action at home. Here's Rick Kelly. That was pretty frantic in the garage just prior to the start to get an engine change. That's two engines at Jack Daniels Racing in two days now. Okay, now here come the boys. Now we've got the two engineers in front of me, David Couchy and Jeff Slater, talking their boys up to the line. This is so critical. You don't want to give away a metre here, but as I said, the driver can't see. So Shane has chosen to stop quite a way back. Jamie's coming a little further forward, just listening. Okay, this is going to be fantastic to see. They're right on top of where they did those burnouts, I can see. I'll hand over to you guys. Barretts? Larko, as each of those drivers lines up, the corresponding official's yellow flag drops back off the wall. You'll see them cascading at the moment. Now, I'm with Shane Bunker. He has the green flag at the rear of the field. He effectively has control of the race at this point in time. He is waiting for the last yellow flag to come out. There are three to go. In a position in the centre of the track. The last flag is down. We have a green flag. Green flag. Third and final race of the Clipsal 500 of 2014. It's already been an extraordinary weekend. And that's a great start from Jamie Wincup. From second on the grid, takes the race lead from Shane Van Gisbergen straight away and leads them through the chicane. Garth Tandon nestles in behind Van Gisbergen. He actually swiped Rick Kelly, who touched the tyres. So Rick got squeezed onto the Turn 1 tyres. You can see a lot of damage there. That's going to be a problem for him on this opening lap. Up to Turn 4. That Garth Tander then, did, they didn't have room, the two of them. Garth turned across and that's hit those tyres, as Neil said. A lot of damage, a lot of drama here. Three abreast between five and six. How's the start from Winkup? He did not give Van Gisbergen a look in. He's just checking whether it's got steering because... 
because if it gets to this corner and it pops a tyre, you have a massive accident. And the fact that Rick was delayed has actually opened up that gap to the top three cars and it's created a queue in behind and here they are. Lowndes looking down the inside of Tim Slade at nine. And Slade actually ended up wide there with cool tyres and no grip on the outside. It was a nice pass actually. Good job. So first time around. Wing cut. Got a great jump. Van Gisbergen has to settle into the routine. He He's done the most important thing by not making by making sure that Wing Cup hasn't got too far away. The bottle O entry of David Reynolds straight in to pit lane. Let's keep our eyes on car 15, see if he's got full control of it. He's managed to complete a lap, Rick Kelly. Yeah, we'll just see. I'm not sure what's going to happen here. They're going to dive in. This will be a very quick splash of fuel. No tyres. We're not surprised to see this the guys are in on lap one, two. You probably see some in the first five. They'll fill that right up now, and out he goes. As we talked about that strategy, he'll try and get through to lap 38. So because he's qualified poorly by the standards that they want to set. Seriously good corner, isn't it? And Botlo racing, what they wanted to do there was to be able to just tick off one of the mandatory stops, get that out of the way, get some fuel on board, and hope that strategy gives them a benefit later in the race. That's what they're trying to do. And Gisbergen looking racy down the inside at the final corner. Jamie Wincup's had one or two troubles there this weekend, actually trying to get that car turned and stopped and pick the throttle up on the other side. You can see him glimpsing the rear view mirror down to turn one. He was disappointed yesterday to let that one get away in the battle with Scotty McLaughlin. He loved the exchange. He thought it was a brilliant battle. But he was also a little bit wounded by the reaction of the crowd at the end of the day as well. He did get an excellent start. Here's the replay of the race three start. It was a beautiful jump in car one. Look at him. He just leapt away from Van Gisberg and Rick Kelly got a good start as well. But focus on Tanda and Kelly and watch what happens down here at one. So the squeeze from the uh, right side of the car on uh, Rick, squeezed him across to the left and onto the tyres. He was lucky he didn't that's end up That's almost a crash. Around. Well, that's almost in the fence, isn't it? Mm, yeah. Oh, Todd uh, Kelly. Uh, throttle cable. He, he says it's got no throttle, it's just idling. Broken throttle cable. Van Kisberg had a little look there on the inside at turn nine. Garth Tander was fastest for that last lap and then Craig Lowndes posted a quick one, 122.649 is the fastest. But up to the second sector of this lap, Van Gisbergen's been the quickest out there. So instantly, Van Gisbergen has shown that maturity is coming to him as Craig Lowndes goes straight into pit lane. Chas Mostert's going to follow him, and so too Fabian Coulthard and some others. Okay, just down here, running through the pit lane, I can see the FPR boys are out. For looks like uh, Mostert and Lowndes is in there. Let's have a look. Top him up for fuel. They are going to put tyres on. Unusual this early in the race. Again, this is part of that whiteboard strategy we showed you. These guys are electing to come in to get their first stop out of the way. Probably about 30 litres going in the car. Now they know the next time they come in, they've got to put 900 litres in to get that 140 and they're done. One stop out of the way, good strategy. That would have been a second or two longer than it should have been because I was watching closely at our window here. The fuel man couldn't get in properly, he couldn't engage properly, he was shaking his head, so it was a couple of seconds delay before they managed to start running that fuel in the couplings. The angle on those hoses is critical in the coupling in order to be able to get the dry brake coupled up and get the fuel delivered. And if you don't have the inbound angle correct, they just don't couple. So here's Todd Kelly limping with no throttle percentage in a very awkward spot. The white Gee. flag's indicating to the other competitors that there's a slow car. Lucky no one's around. That's mm. right at the apex there. And so he's limping that car back home. Here's the little battle going on at the front. It's 0.2 of a second according to the computer. You can see how tight that margin is. James Courtney, meantime, pretty quick back in the pack here at 11th. 
Gisberg just did the fastest lap of the race at 122.1. He lost a bit of ground on the previous lap, but he's gathered back up again now. And he's able to place his car in a number of different spots relative to Jamie at the moment. You can see that they're both choosing different lines on the racetrack. Just have a look at this. Have a look how close you need to be at turn eight. We're on board with the leader, Wink Cup. Looking back at Van Gisbergen. Check the right-hand side, how close it is to the inside apex. Check this. Beautifully done. Very smooth, very nice. As you go faster, you have to be softer with all the steering inputs. And what he did then is he turned it very gently and got it right into the apex. Very accurate, very McLaugh nice. McLaughlin on Slade here. This is the battle for seventh. There's quite a string of cars involved in this. Tim's car doesn't look to settle off those curbs as nicely as it no. should. It bounces. It's got an oscillation in the car that's ongoing. Todd's pulled to the grass to get out of the way there. Smart move, Todd. Just give everybody space and the Holden Racing team have brought car number 22 in for his first compulsory stop. So when Neil's talking about the way that the car rides the curb, the way that you've got to do it and do it nicely is when they come off the curb, the car's got to settle immediately. You can see it doesn't. Guys, James caught the in for his first stop. It'll be four tyres, fuel. They are waiting. The thing that's impressive in pit lane is just how good the crews are at this first hit out of the year. I mean, obviously, they do their practice away from the track, but to be this slick at this stage of the year is fantastic. Courtney away. This is the DJR. This is Chaz Most at car number six. And that's the tyre bundle at turn one. Slam. Oh. Just rips apart the front splitter. Power steering drama for him in race one yesterday, Marco. Yeah, just interesting watching James Courtney put his four tyres there. A lot of this will be about what tyre bank you've got. This is going to be a tough afternoon, but you saw Craig Lowndes put two tyres on him. He did a little bit of that yesterday, and you can almost bet as a result of that he will have a good tyre bank and expect four tyres later in the day when it really matters. That was Jason Bright you saw moving to fifth, and McLaughlin has got through on Tim Slade there, seventh. So, Wind Cup. Come towards the green light, mate. Come towards the green light. Wind Cup, Van Gisbergen, Tander, Rick Kelly, Bright, Winterbottom, McLaughlin, Slade. Then Holdsworth and Moffat. That's the tent. Oh, that was a nasty leap over that second curb there for McLaughlin. He slid up to the second curb and this is Nick Percat. We can hear them in the background on the radio. Fastest lap of the race being time of 1.21.7 for Wind Cup. Penalty yesterday for Percat. This man also suspended penalty for the dangerous rejoin. So three cars in the pit lane. Todd Kelly did get back in there and they'll be looking at that throttle cable problem or whatever it is with the throttle assembly on that car. Ooh, a bit squeeze for room on the inside. James Courtney in turn one. You can see the amount of fuel going in, Neil. And only after now seven laps of 78, they've obviously started the cars without full load. So roughly between 60 and 70 litres of fuel have been put in the car to start with, which means you can actually put that fuel in so early in the race. What is so impressive in these longer races is just how quickly the engineers can change strategy on the hop. Scotty McLaughlin's crew were in pit lane ready for him to come in for a stop, but he finally got that clear air that he needed, and now he's got the clear traffic. So they've come back in and resetting their strategy for this race. It's a good point. It's, sorry, Neil. It's a good point. That's what you're looking for. So important in this sort of race to make sure you're out and you're using your own car speed. Well, if you watched our coverage yesterday in race one, you saw Wind Cup and... Red Bull Racing Australia give a good lesson on that. They got two tyres on that car. They shot him out there in clear air, and it worked very well. And later in the race, there was a dividend for it. Here's a replay of McLaughlin getting that pass done on Tim Slade from the chopper down at turn nine. Tim's giving him plenty of space. Fair slide going on for McLaughlin to get through because he was completely brake limited there. And car number 36, black flag, pit lane penalty for uh, 
exceeding the pit lane speed limit. That's Michael Caruso, the Nissan Hornets entry. Yeah, and just reflecting quickly on further on those strategy comments, very much in the way that Wink Up is out in front. You hear us often talk about track position. Well, there's two things that are king when defining your strategy. Track position, that could be out in front or in clear air, as we saw with Scotty Block McLaughlin, and speed. And if you've got track position and speed, all of a sudden you're in charge of the strategy game. Rick Kelly has his hands full with Jason Bright on the charge and Mark Winterbottom behind him. Jamie Winkup leads the race by just under a second from Shane Van Gisbergen who continues to put pressure on the leader. Garth Tand is in at third. And the final 250 k's are underway. Initial burst of adrenaline to start the race. Now settles into the rhythm time and on track. He's in. Whoa, he's gone into the wall. Straight into the wall and huge damage at turn eight for Will Davison. Turn it in, sir. So. Put me into turn eight. I've gone in hard. Take it. Just pull on the side of the road, please. Pull on the side of the road. It's pretty bad. We can see it on TV. I turned it in narrow and I pointed to the screen when they were heading down there. There was traffic congestion and I knew there'd be a drama. He's plucked the front left wheel off that car. So you'll see people react to this. I'll take the, the safety car opportunity which has been scrambled to Peters. Chrysler safety cars being deployed. So Wink Up, Tanda, Bright, Winterbottom, McLaughlin, Slade, Pine, Moffat, Wood and Ingle all took the opportunity to come straight in. Quick reaction time from the crew. That's a mess. That is a mess. It's cost Mark Winterbottom. Can't help you with the front straight, mate. Can't help you. That's the damage that Chaz Mostert did to the front of car six at the tyre bundle in turn one. It's just that mad scramble that you hear. And it's just ripped the front left straight off the car, taking the door with it. Huge damage. So he's narrow because he rounded up James Moffat. I can see it all brewing in the background. Any time you go narrow into turn eight, oh, oh it was a, a touch. Bump. It was a touch as well. That didn't help. So the little bump just now just changes the trajectory, can't get it turned. 
and that really caused it. Now, he may have been very close by himself because he was already on a very narrow line, but... But that little contact gave him no choice. He got it to the dirty stuff, like that, bang. Oh. Two cameras, Betty Flamenco and Ryan Madison. Betty, the team owner, and Ryan, the CEO of Erebus Motorsport, will will be shattered. Betty Flamenco, I hate doing this because this is not the time we want to talk to you, but you just said to me, this is motor racing, but you saw the replay just now. What are your thoughts? It's motor racing, that's what we're here for. The highs, the highs, lows, the lows, and you have to take them all, otherwise you end up with an ulcer. I'm glad that you have that attitude. We might just quickly try get Will Davison before he runs off. Will, we just want to know if you're OK. It was obviously a very hard hit. We just want to know if you're OK. No, I'm fine. I'm fine. Just uh, obviously disappointed. Yeah, drove it back with no door on it. So, uh, yeah, I got it, uh, <laughs> got it back, which is a first. But, um, yeah, I need to have a good look at the replay. We just saw a, a footage of the replay and it showed that you had a bit of contact with one of the Norton cars before hitting the wall. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I've got to run on Moff because he stuffed up at turn seven. He's driven me all the way over to the wall on the inside. And then it was, yeah, pretty, pretty straightforward run into turn eight. Um, you had the inside line, he was obviously conceding. And uh, yeah, he's just clipped my left rear as I turned in. So yeah, pretty, uh, pretty stupid. Uh, yeah, I don't know. I have to have a good look. I tried, thought I gave him a bit of room. It's pretty narrow into there, so um, yeah, it's uh, not cool. Bad luck, Will. Thank you. The good news is he's okay. Full course yellow here at the Clipsal 500. This was the moment that ruined Will Davison's Mercedes E63, ripped it apart on the left-hand side. And we know now that there was contact with James Moffat, car 360. And that's 240 kilometres on approach into that turn, and you just whack straight into the concrete wall. So what do you think? Should Moff be penalised for that move? v8supercars.com.au slash vote. Or go via our 7 Sport app and have your say on the viewer vote. Will Davison is not a happy man. So the Petters Chrysler safety car is still in control of the field. A field that has Van Gisbergen and Rick Kelly at the top and they've not stopped yet. So they're the only two that haven't taken a stop and several took the opportunity to use that safety car. But Tim Edwards, a very unlucky pit stop for Mark Winterbottom, just got caught up in traffic getting out. 
Yeah, I think we just put a bit more fuel in than other people, which might help us later on. But unfortunately, it meant that it, as he went to leave the boxes, about five cars trundling past, and rather than balk one of them and be done for unsafe release, we told him to stop, let him go past, and pulled out after him. So, yeah, not great. But it's one of those things. Wasn't much in it. Well, there was I mean, nothing he could do. He's either going to have an accident, yeah. and Tim's observation's right. If he did turn left, he would have made contact, and then they'll just bring him through the pit lane. Um, it's excruciating when you're in the driver's seat because it feels like an eternity before you can actually get back on with it. So as you say, Van Gisberg and Kelly did not pit. Winkup is the first of the list that have. Already you're on to it. 69% believe that James should cop a penalty for that touch-up on the back of car number nine. Continue having your say. You can vote as many times as you want. Car 34 of Robert Dahlgren makes another journey through the pit lane. OK, restart time. Puts it in the hands of Shane Van Gisberg and in the acceleration zone. Look at them all spread out. They go in search of their own piece of real estate. They bump and grind and push and shove. And now they've got to come all back together again. Oh! One. Jason Bright over and over and up and into the wall. Oh. That started with Slade right, down the inside. Just uh, give us a radio call if you're there, buddy. Huge damage to car 16 of Scott Pye again. Yep. Check, please. You and got me. Chaz Mostert. Hey. Team Cairo, Adele White, Wally Story in the foreground, engineer. Andrew Edwards, Jason's engineer is frantically yeah, trying to make radio contact. And damage to Lee Holdsworth. The front left, that's going to wobble its way around the circuit for car four. So, and look on the inside of the cabin. Oh, gee, that's huge. Just got to go steady now because you easily run straight to the fence here. And he had, was already carrying damage to the front left-hand corner of that car and they were asking him to just take it easy. So Tander's got damage in the front right-hand corner there. Well, that come from, that's how it started there. Because Slade was down the inside. That's how it started. So Slade was down the inside with Tanda and Courtney. Three abreast, team cars. Van Gisbergen's come in, by the way. He's out of the car. Jason Bright, OK. Scott Pye's out of the car as well. Fantastic. So this was the race leader. And this is going to be a significant delay to get that car cleared. But Brighty was involved in a pretty big crash at the Bathurst 12-hour that he wound up in hospital for, he was checked out and OK. So that's two enormous shunts in the space of just a few weeks. The hard, the hard thing when you're upside down in the belt is actually to be able to safely manoeuvre yourself out of the car. And when um, electronics in the car after a prescribed period don't sense any action from the crank trigger the electronics in the car shut down here's the replay this will give us some explanations we'll try to come in together so it's tim slade leans on the holden racing team car which just sends team boc commodore flipping into the air this was what happened they all fanned out and then they all came back in and it was never going to work van gisberg and kelly get through and then watch car 47 just pushes across and it doesn't take much for Garth Tander just to lean on the front left hand side of Jason Bright. Oof. It's that secondary impact that's the worry there with the wall and it got right up in the top of the debris fence. This is Lee Holdsworth's view. Oh, that was the big crunch that he... So, OK, so he got hit by Scott Pye and a few others. The contact actually started with the two Red Bull cars. They actually made contact on the way in there also. There's Slade down the inside. He makes contact with Tanda. Tanda makes contact with Bright. Totally out on the slide. Full opposite lock, so he's trying to steer it down. So Jason's trying to make sure it doesn't turn onto its roof. It then catches the kerb. And the kerb then trips it over. 
So as it gets to that point there, it was always going to turn over. Yeah. Must have picked up the front right wheel of Tander's car in order to be able to do that launch. And Tander's in the pit lane and has been there for a while now as well. So it'd be pretty fair old damage on that. It's this next whack with the wall. All this stuff looks spectacular, but at that stage, it's not a crazy amount of damage. It's this next one where it hits the concrete wall. It is tyre protected and then gets into the debris fence where they're going to have a big nightmare trying to resolve getting this car back in shape. Well, fortunately, where the, where the massive load has actually taken place in terms of the final part of the crash, Neil, it was actually against the tyres there. That's taken some load away from that. And that's a tonne and a half. Yeah, it's a tonne and a half in the air there. It's just been tossed around like a toy car. Well, I'm in the garage with Brad Jones, and Brad, no team is more of a family than yours, and just collectively, your hearts were in mouths there for a few minutes. Ah, uh, yeah, you know, it's just, you know, we really wanted to come out of this this weekend with a good spot. You know, I felt Jason in the BOC car was one of the fastest uh, cars on the track at the time, and, and you know, to see that, that happen is very difficult, but he got out of the car and he's OK, and uh, so, you know, you live to fight another day, but it's, a, you know, it's difficult to watch, and and it'll certainly be an expensive repair. Brad, as you look at that, I mean, the, the car couldn't be in better hands with Bridie. He, he fought it as, as well as he could. I don't think you have a lot of control <laughs> over them when they're flying through the air like that, Barrett. You can steer it as hard as you want and dab the brake, but, you know, anyone could roll a car over here. That could happen to anyone. But the good news is he's got out of the car. He's fine. The, you know, the cars are built to a, a very high standard of safety, and um, the car's done its job, and it's just unfortunate that um, we're going to leave here and we have to be on the back foot in the championship with that team because I, I really felt they had a good chance this year. Good on you, Brad. Thanks, mate. Thank you. Another bloke we'll talk to, uh, Tim Edwards, principal down here at FPR, Ford Performance Racing. Amazing how this game can just turn like it isn't it, mate? You had your pit stop drama, well, not a drama, a decision you had to make with Frosty. And then, of course, Chaz out there. Now, we saw him trying to limp home. What finally pulled him up? Uh, we were monitoring the telemetry and then all of a sudden it lost oil pressure, so obviously not going to risk the engine, so we just got him to turn the car off. Watch, I assume it's ripped the line off in the incident down there? Oh, I'd suspect the oil cooler, everything. You know, he's lost steering as well, so there's a fair bit of front-end damage to it. It's, it's a long way back, so I don't think there was any chance we are going to get back, back out again anyway. Tim, you must be pleased, though. I mean, you've been close to this whole development of this new generation of car, and it's incidents like this, as ugly as they are, uh, it's great to see the drivers get out as they do. I mean, it's a great endorsement of the vehicle, isn't it? Oh, absolutely. I mean, we saw that accident with Courtney last year as well. And I mean, we've seen similar accidents in the past that have been you know, a lot more serious of consequences. So absolutely, they're a lot safer. Yep, that does bring a tear to my eye looking at the screen now. But at the end of the day, it's, you know, we can repair it. It's just a bit frustrating that how it's happened. I guess the most important thing is, mate, it's the points issue, isn't it? Because you've got to build a foundation at Clipsal for the year. Yeah, I mean, one of the things we talked about in our pre-brief last week was that, you know, we want to come out here with a decent points haul. You know, we might not go away with 300 points, but if we can come away with a good points haul, you know, Frosty, unfortunately, last year lost 150 points in the first race, and he chased for the whole year to try and get that back. Sometimes you end up overdriving because you're trying to, you know, you're trying to catch up. So, you know, we've got some good points, you know, with, with Frosty yesterday. You know, we've got a little bit of, on the back foot at the moment, but I think we'll catch up. All right, thanks, Timmy. So that uh, replay also showed how Holdsworth got connected with Scott Pye, and then it was Chaz Mostert who went slamming into car 16. So casualties on the streets of Adelaide here at the Clipsal 500.
The beauty of this Sunday afternoon here in Adelaide belies the chaos that's going on down at the circuit level where we're still under safety cars, uh, safety car conditions because, of course, the cleanup continues at the chicane and the casualty count rises. Scott Pye, unfortunately, I'm talking to you again in, in bad circumstances. First and foremost, are you OK? Yeah, yeah, I'm fine. Just crutch, crutch straps got me, but... Um... Yeah, I mean, I, th I think, to be honest, the starts are a joke. Uh, doing a restart like that, you've got 25 cars, and uh, it only took what happened then was one bad start from someone, and you've got, well, just in front of me, I was following three cars going into Turn 1 side by side. It's just, it's never going to work, and unfortunately, Bridie and myself uh, have come off the worst, but, yeah, I think it's a joke. I mean, the last, the, the old safety car period seemed to work fine. I don't know what we're, what we're thinking here. How do you mentally get yourself back in the car and get yourself refocused? Unfortunately, you've been involved in a, a number of quite substantial crashes in, in a short period of time. How do, you, how do you get yourself refocused? Yeah, I think we're always prepared that that can happen out there. Obviously, I'm still standing here and I'm fine, so it hasn't bothered me at all. It's just, it's, uh, it's obviously frustrated me no end. And, and obviously for the boys as well, you know, it's not, you don't want to be tearing up cars. Obviously, last year was mechanical and today's just bad luck. But uh, yeah, there's nothing you can do about it, unfortunately. Um, those sorts of things just piss you off because you can't, you know, it's not my fault, it's not Bridie's fault, uh, it's just, just bad luck at the end of the day, there's nothing you can do about it. We're glad you're okay and we're looking forward to seeing you out there soon. Thanks guys. Cheers. Lee Holdsworth, back in the garage. Lee, uh, your view on what happened out there with Jason Bright, what did you see? Oh, look, these restarts are an absolute joke at the moment. They've got this um, new acceleration zone. It's just not working. We all know, knew it would create an absolute uh, chaos at Turn 1, and fair enough, you know, sure enough it did. And um, I saw Bridie getting turned by someone. He went up onto two wheels, and I was trying to avoid the whole thing by going through the gravel trap. And then uh, I think it was Scott Pye came straight across the front of me, tore the front end out of it. Hopefully we get some points and get back out there, but I'm just... Uh, oh, we can't take a trick at the moment. Thanks, Lee. All the best. Thanks, mate. OK, so you heard Lee talking about the restarts. He doesn't like them. OK, that's fair enough. But what we've seen is last year, remember, in the 60-60 races, we had the, the cars side by side, 60 kilometres an hour. Now, now the rule is they've got to be in Indian file. Maybe they are better off side by side, watching the way they fan out. Now, when they come along, you see these two signs behind me on the straight here? The acceleration zone. So the leader has to pull the field up. Now, they're going to come around here in a minute. Jason Bargwana, our driving standards observer, new driving standards observer, will not tolerate cars fanning out, coming out from behind the car during this lead-up. I'm just waiting for them to come around the corner behind me. So, if you'll be 50 to 60 kilometres an hour, literally bumper to bumper, single file. Now, you watch, absolutely line astern, and listen for the leader's engine. Inside those two orange signs, hovering, hovering. Go! Same thing, Larko. They all spread out again. So they're all going to have to find their own piece of land. Otherwise, it'll be a repeat. Four cars side by side. Rick Kelly, Jamie Winkup, Craig Lowndes. Look at James Courtney hugging the fence as he has a look on the inside of Tim Slade. It's a bottleneck from Slade back. And the front three have taken advantage of the clean air. Oh, oh, contact. And hey. winner bottom into the fence. That was contact with Nick Perkat. He's deep into the tyre bundle, but he gets it out. It's not an easy trick, that one. Let's we'll have a look at the front of this now. Interesting to see how well the tyres absorb that energy. Courtney on Slade. This is for fourth. He's done a very, very good job. He started 15th. That's going to go, as you said, into fourth spot. Car 360, James Moffat, pit lane drive-through penalty for a driving infringement at turn 
eight on car nine. So that was the Will Davison, Will Davison incident. incident, which is basically at the centre of all the stuff that came subsequently. The trigger of what's happened next. Yeah. I'm not I was watching closely Rick Kelly's restart there. He waited deep into that acceleration zone. A little bit deeper than others have. Normally, uh, they see the first orange sign and let it go. Well, Rick was waiting, waiting, and then he fired. So James Moffat probably would have known that was coming. And this will show us Nick Perk at car triple two. Just giving the hip and shoulders to Mark Winterbottom. Pretty wild and mid-pack. Scotty McLaughlin there. So Frosty just tagged yep. Scott. And then watch this. Bang. And there's zero grip out there. This shot will be pretty graphic. Oh, actually, Perkett got a whack. He got a push from... Might have been Dale Wood. Maybe Dale Wood, yep. There's always more to it, isn't there? Well, it was also a circumstance... 97 and 15. Pit lane drive through penalty. Oh, Tim Schenken. So 15 one. and 97. Yeah. In the first one. Yep. Because I sure would have debated that if it was the second one because Kelly waited and waited. Okay, so the first one. So that's Rick Kelly here on screen and Shane Van Gisbergen, who's 11th. It's going to put him out. Kelly currently leading. And he hasn't taken a stop at this point. Fabian Coulthard's done a really good job, Neil. He started 16th, he's currently 6th. Dave Reynolds, 22nd to 7th. Ingle, 24th to 13th. And as we said, James Courtney, 15th to 4th. They're the real winners so far in terms of making ground in the early stages. The 78 lap 250k closing part of the Clips of 500. We're only 20 odd laps in. Yeah, oh, 20 odd oh, laps here in. we go. Jack Perkins has had an off here. I think that was Dale Wood who's disappearing in the foreground, and we saw he had contact a bit earlier as well in that Nick Perkett incident. So Perkins' front of the car is damaged as well. But Rick Kelly, you know, not surprisingly, unhappy up. with the pit lane drive through penalty. He's leading this race and he's on the phone at the moment Sorry, and trying to battle these down. other guys behind. So here's a replay. What's the story here? So oh, that uh, Russell. Rusty. Russell into Dale Wood and then Jack didn't get tagged. He just had nowhere to go. There goes Rick for his penalty. That leaves Red Bull 1 and 2. Racing pretty fiercely at the moment, cars 1 and Triple Eight. Well, they made contact at the start. So Rick Kelly's been pinged for accelerating along with Shane Van Gisbergen. Prior to the acceleration zone, it's hard to tell from that angle, but gee. Oh, it, look like it. it looks, if you watch closely the front spoiler of those cars, I can't believe that they've restarted too early based on that. I mean, it's hard to have that proximity from the view that we had. Have a look at this. Because okay, here's so the A to Z. Now watch the front spoiler. They're totally in the zone. Yeah, they've pulled away from everyone else. But so possibly, we, possibly it's the illusion oh, yeah, of Jamie oh, yeah. Winkup slowing down. I was about to say it might be more to do with the artificial gap that got created. Yeah. I, I'm confused by that one. I'm totally with you. And given that, there goes Damien White from uh, V8 Supercars just in the garage explaining to Steve Hallam and the Techno team exactly the situation for Shane Gant Van Gisbergen. And uh, I might just try and catch with uh, John O'Webb very quickly. Uh, Jono, a, a black flag, That uh, your reaction to that on Shane? Mate, I've got, uh, got no idea what's going on, to be honest. I mean, I can only see what everyone else can see on TV. And from there, he was spot on in that zone where he should have been when he went. So, obviously, officials are thinking something different. But, uh, you know, extremely frustrating. They throw something new at us. And uh, maybe they haven't explained it to the drivers well enough of what they want. Thanks, mate. Thanks. OK, listen to this. This will give us the engine. And wind cup definitely slowed up. And you're supposed to be within one one car length. 
So, I reckon they're in. I reckon they're in the zone. I reckon they've been pinned unfairly. Hard to tell from those angles. You never know. But what it has done, it's cost Rick Kelly and Shane Van Gisbergen a crack at this race. They're going to have to do it the hard way if they're going to do it. Back after this. been a costly 15 or 20 minutes of this race not only for those who were hoping to have a crack at it up the front of Rick Kelly and Shane Van Gisbergen but for those who have already been ruled out what do you think were the drive-through penalties fair for Shane Van Gisbergen and Rick Kelly look at this Van Gisbergen oh, gets a strike against his name for curb hopping as he rejoins after serving his penalty your V8 viewer vote v8supercars.com.au slash vote or use our 7 Sport app and see what you think about that. Did the stewards get it right? Did they get it wrong? It's always hard to tell whether or not they're exactly in that acceleration zone. But from the angles that we've been able to establish, it looks as though it was a really tough call. OK, the scenario is this. Jamie Wincup now leads from Craig Lowndes, James Courtney, Tim Slade, Fabian Coulthard, Scott McLaughlin in sixth, Nick Perkat, David Reynolds, Michael Caruso and David Wall make up our top 10. On lap 26 out of 78, so more than 50 to go. We've got 16 cars on the road. Russell Ingle is in pit lane. The casualty list of Tander, Holdsworth, Mostert, Bright, Pye, Dahlgren, Davison, Todd Kelly. One of those survival days. Mark and I have been looking in the ops manual just to get a grasp of what's going on out there at the moment. And uh, the rule as they approach that acceleration zone, at the time the safety car accelerates away from the lead car, will then dictate the speed, which must be less than 60 kilometres an hour, no more than 50 kilometres an hour. The practice of aggressively accelerating and or braking and or moving left or right is prohibited from this point. All cars must remain directly in line with the car immediately in front as they approach the apex of the last turn. 
and must be no more than one car length behind the car immediately in front as they approach the apex of the last turn. Where I need clarification is what happens after that then, because in, under the safety car in normal situation, it's, it's a five cars. car length yeah. rule that dictates it. So there will be some significant arguing going on down there at the moment. Yeah, you're on the you're on the money, Neil, because uh, we're all thinking it was conjecture about whether they fired the cars off within the zone or not. That's not the issue. And I'll let Damien White explain uh, exactly what the conjecture is over here, mate. The rule is very clear that the leader is to maintain between 50 and 60 before they get to the first acceleration zone sign. If the lead car is to accelerate beyond 60, even at a gradual pace, it is then on the second place car to maintain 50 to 60 and the front guy will get the penalty. In this case, 97 crept above that 60 before the acceleration zone. 15 maintained that gap, therefore he was then in breach. Car one, bit of discipline there, maintained that 50 to 60, no issue. The hard acceleration of 97 was correct in the AZ zone, but the penalty is because he exceeded the 60 limit before entering that AZ. Very well put. If you go back and have a look at the vision, I reckon Damo is exactly right. OK. OK, my question is, how do we know that? How do we know it, Larko? Ask him. Sorry, mate, we're, we're just keen to know, how do you know that? How do you know the facts that okay. you've just stated? What are the tools to use? We have radar, of course. But we, it was explained at the driver's briefing. The other aspect we've got is a visual. And visually, by the other 23 cars maintaining 50 to 60, and you've got two others accelerating away before the AZ, it's reasonable to assume, in conjunction with all the other bits and pieces we've got going on, that there was a breach. Yeah. There's no question there was a breach. Pretty clear. OK. Well, the argument will rage. It will continue to rage. Our V8 fuel vote is going heavily in favour of the drivers on that one. Jamie Winkup leads the race. Controversy here at the Clipsal. There wouldn't be an event here in Adelaide without it. And Carnage as well. And still a long, long way to go. Welcome back to Adelaide and the Clipsal 500 of 2014. Well, there's just under 50 laps to go. And there are 17 cars now on the road. Garth Tander has rejoined the efforts, the mad scramble to get some points. So let's bring you up to speed with what's happened so far. Well, a lot's happened from the start. Rick Kelly was the first to suffer some damage 
but he managed to work his way through that as Jamie Wincup took advantage from Shane Van Gisberg and they had a bit of trouble getting the fuel into car triple eight but in the scheme of things that hasn't really bothered them then this a touch from James Moffat on Will Davison at the fastest part of the circuit puts Will's Mercedes into the wall hard and that's the end of both of our cameras down there as Betty Clemenko watches on Will's okay the front left wheel plucked off left side of that car wreck mark winner bottom had nothing to do but wait in pit lane and then this almighty crash involving Jason Bright who flips over twice and then spins up into the air corkscrew style he would get out of that car okay but that was off the restart off the first restart it would also cost Scott Pye his afternoon Lee Holdsworth also suffered damage in that one. Garth Tander suffered some damage, but has got back out there. And that's about one and a half tonnes of V8 supercar just thrown into the air like a matchbox car. Acceleration zone, that's been the controversy. And then enough. The other restart, well, Mark Winterbottom was forced into the wall. Dale Wood got turned around by Russell Ingle. And then this penalty for both car 15 and 97 for speeding up before they reach the acceleration zone on the last restart. Hey, Jason Brown, a lifetime in motorsport. You've been through some ups and downs, but I'm glad you can still smile about that. Whoa, that was some ride. Yeah, it was a bit of a ride. I've, yeah, I've had a little while in motorsport. It's the first time that I've rolled into things, so, uh, yeah, a little bit disappointing. You know, we had an extremely quick VOC car this weekend, and, you know, we're not going to leave here with the amount of points we deserve, I don't think, on pace, so... Pretty disappointing. Um, you know, the new starts. I guess whoever made that rule got what they wanted. They wanted action. Just cost the teams a hell of a lot of money. Though, that's all. Anyone to blame? Oh no. I mean, Jamie made a bad start. It's not his fault though. I mean, we just ended up three abreast there. Um, you know, I'm not sure who who got into who, but you know, we we, we got put sideways onto the curb. You know, I think the, the only one to blame is probably whoever decided to have have uh, a type of start that you know we don't see anywhere else in the world you know that's a, that's the worst part you know it's it's just you know putting a lot of lot of cars at risk um, you know we're all out there racing as hard as we can and you know there's going to be situations like that if we continue to use those starts um, you know but if they want if they want action they're going to get it Righty, we'll just have a look at it just take a look at the monitor up there and, and just talk us through what you were experiencing as you went through this Oh, uh, the old fella was getting squashed a little bit about now. Um, but it was, uh, you know, I... It was actually a lot more gentle than what I expected, considering I haven't rolled a car before. And the worst part was landing on the roof at the end after it sort of climbs the fence here. And that was sort of the hardest landing. And then uh, sitting upside down, trying to get yourself out when everything's sort of back to front is the hardest part. So, uh, you know, good thing the cars are strong. You know, I felt... Felt oh, really secure in my seat, you know, and all the safety gear did its job. It's a good thing it did. Look, I know you'll feel a little bit sore tomorrow, but for now, Brody, everything's good. Yeah, cheers, mate. All good. Well done, mate. Thank you. Now, question I want to really target at the race team manager down here, Mark Dutton at Triple Eight. Mark, we were, um, we've just spoken to Damien White, who was quite clear about the penalties that happened at the restart there before. Yep. Now, we know that you've got to stay within one car length, but if the guys in front go faster, yep. uh, you maintain. Now, he said well-disciplined by the team behind, which was yours. Yes. Was that an intentional move by you guys? Were you across that at that point of time? Oh, totally. It was, it was completely clear in the uh, driver's briefing. So every driver made clear, do not exceed 60. If the car's in front go, you do not you maintain 60 no matter what. So there's a really clear message for teams down the pit lane there. Do your homework, do the job right, and you wonder why this team wins? Well, there it is right there. Robert Dahlgren, it's been a really tough initiation into V8 Supercars Championship for yourself, but today it's been mechanical dramas that have let you down. Yeah, it has. I didn't do any laps in qualifying, and now uh, just did a couple of laps and did an early pit stop, and uh, after that, the smoke came out in, into the car. I didn't know where, where it was from, but... Uh, the smell of it was oil and uh, yes, we need to stop. You were just watching that race highlights package with myself there. What do you think about this racing? It's absolute crazy. I've never seen anything like it, but it's good for TV as long as nobody hurt himself. But it, uh, it's good for the crowd. Sit back and enjoy the show. All right, well, thank you. <laughs> yeah, his head spinning, Robert Dahlgren. And, uh, he just can't believe that this is 
what the V8 supercars do week in, week out. So social media, as you can imagine, is absolutely lighting up like a Christmas tree over these penalties. And the explanation about the penalties, 79%, say that uh, penalties weren't fair. We've had more than 130,000 votes on this question in just a matter of minutes. And a lot of the feedback on social media has been about the assumption of the speed. People want to know the facts. So that's something that we're going to have to deal with down the track. And also there's clearly driver anger about the restart format themselves so maybe we can ask you a question about that lap 34 out of 78 has jamie Winkup in charge by 1.7 seconds over his teammate craig lowndes and james courtney is nestled in third eclipse all 500 here on seven For quite a while now, this race has been consumed by controversy and carnage. Now we're back into a real race rhythm. And it's Red Bull Racing Australia at the front. Two Walkinshaw Commodores chasing of Courtney and Slade. Then Scott McLaughlin, the Volvo. And Craig Lowndes has lost a lot of time on Wink Cup. And this is why. Big slide from Lowndes. He's battling to pull it up at the final corner. Right out sideways. It's like a rally car arrival in turn 14, wasn't it? And lost a lot of ground there, didn't he? And he was right behind Wing Cup. He was probably around a second behind Wing Cup. He's now three seconds behind Jamie. So that was a big moment. Very fast section of road there as you approach turn 13 the cars do almost 200 kilometers an hour 190k at the apex of turn 13 and right where russell ingle is now is where craig lounge had massive amount of opposite lock and a bit of an ugly tank slapper so russell back out there lee holdsworth has also returned to the scene so we've now got 19 cars on the track yeah, boys, I just actually wanted to quickly clear things up here in the uh, Volvo garage. 
Um, Gary Rogers, now correct me if I'm wrong, Scott McLaughlin, he finished his apprenticeship as a fabricator. He has, yep. His car is fine, Robert's not so much. No, well, I mean, Scott's finished his apprenticeship. He still works there as a fabricator and a really good one. What we're concerned, though, it's got a girlfriend now. He's in love, I reckon. His welding skills are dropping off a whisker and he made the oil tank in this car, which is now leaking. I mean, this could be a federal investigation in this one, mate. <laughs> we'll, get it. we'll get the feds onto it. Yeah, good on you, <laughs> So it's the oil problem that's ruled Robert Dahlgren out. Slade's just had some drama because he was right up behind Courtney and now as we go on board with Scott McLaughlin, he's right behind Slade. So Slade's fallen back by about 2.3 seconds from Courtney. So that's Slade. Just up the road there is Courtney. So he's also had a bit of a moment. So McLaughlin up to fifth. So Wink Cup Lounge, Courtney, Slade, McLaughlin, Coulthard, Percat, Caruso, Reynolds, oh, Winterbottom. That was a serious moment mid-corner then for McLaughlin. He was very lucky to get away with that. Rear of the car stepped out on him. Tim Slade in the foreground. Oh, yeah, indeed. Looks like he just got that inside curb. Yeah, I'm not sure what triggered it, but you could see that he grabbed a huge amount of opposite lock. He's fifth at the moment. And Lowndes is on two curb strikes as well. Here's the overhead shot from the chopper. It'll tell a bit more of the story. Look to see whether he grabs that curb that Matt mentioned on the inside, on the right of the car. Uh, I think he just had a moment. Just went in there too quick. Also in the disturbed air from Hard the... to tell. Here we go. No, yeah, just a moment. Just had a moment. Yeah. Just got away from him. Just balance-wise, not as good as the race has progressed. Look at this. Watch his hands. Attention. <laughs> that would definitely get your attention at 235 kilometres an hour. <laughs> Fabian's come up onto the back of this group also. So Slade's dropped back. It may also be a little bit of the James Courtney story because he was the fastest car on the previous lap. I heard Rob Starr said, good work, JC, fastest car out there at the moment. So Courtney sped away. Slade's come back. Scott's trying to get by Slade. And in the meantime, Fabian, who's shown good race pace all weekend, qualified poorly, but very good race pace has come up to the back of Scott McLaughlin. There you go, there's the three in the battle. Percat's done a good job also. He's right behind Fabian. Dale Wood with a lot of damage to the back of the Advam Commodore from Brad Jones Racing. Craig Lowndes now in the pit. Yeah, and this is very close to the money. We said lap 38 being our sort of critical number. Remember, we've had all those safety car windows, or safety car, sorry, that's pushed that window out. Uh, I've just been along and had a look at the side glasses and all the little fill-ups, the tanks along the pit lane, and there's a variety of options. They're going, there you are, four tyres. We said that earlier on. Craig has saved his tyre bank for the weekend, and four tyres now would be a highly valuable commodity to put onto your race car, believe me. Thank you. Waiting for fuel. United E85 going into the car. We observed a bit of a scuff down the side of Lowndes' car there, down the left-hand side of the car, which may have happened down at the Turn 1 tyre bundle. So the refueler waiting to see fuel coming back up the vent side of those tubes. Make sure we get to the end. Uh, to go. Halfway through the race, so those tyres did about the same as we're going to do now. That's good information from Jeremy to Craig to basically give him a guide of the number of laps the tyres do so that you understand for the next segment of the race what's going to happen. Here we go, a little bit of bumping and a change, and a change position. Of yeah. So McLaughlin now has cleared Tim Slade. So that puts McLaughlin into fourth. Good run. Now third, third after the lounge has stopped. Yep. And the Fabian's going with him. Fabian did a good job, as you made a point earlier, Mark, about road, not having oh, a... A supercar in qualifying, but just did a nice job yesterday in points recovery. Here's the move down at the hairpin at turn nine. Tim's left him a big pile of space down there. It's been pretty gentlemanly down there, hasn't he? Yeah, had a little rub on the exit, but it was uh, it was a pretty easy manoeuvre. Tim said that in yesterday's race, the car went away a lot in the rear, so he may have a repetition of the same issue. Well, you could hear it then. So one of the things that happened is as the tyres come off, the braking performance is also reduced. See Winterbottom in. 
Must have got away with that where he went to the fence with a contact with Percat. So they're putting the incompressible jacks in under the car to make it safe so that they can work beneath it without copying a penalty. And it's sway bar link. Yeah. So basically where the sway bar mounts across to the body of the car, there's all the damage on the left front from where he went in the tyres in turn six. And the sway bar bolts to the body to reduce the roll. It was all a bit messy, but what they had to do was replace that link because the front roll stiffness, if you haven't got the sway bar or the anti-roll bar hooked up, the front of the car is way too soft. So they had to replace the link to ensure that the chassis performance or the chassis dynamics were going to be good enough for the final part of this race. It's like a lifetime waiting for all that fuel to go in. So Courtney, you're a really solid job here. Start at 15, so he's done a really good job. So obviously a little bit out of sync now because they haven't made their second stops, but he's as he comes in. Sorry, Scope, if I can just show. So this is the back of the whole racing team fuel cells that are in the garages here. You see the side glass here? So this is how we know how much fuel they put in their cars. If I pop the head out here, okay. In goes the fuel. Oh, that's a bad stop. They've gone past where he needed to. Now he's got a digital readout you can see in here. He knows precisely how much fuel he wants to put in. Fuel in there, that's the ethanol 85 going in. United ethanol 85. And the other clear hose coming out is the breather. So when it's full, it'll breathe back up that hose. That goes back into the tank. A lot of pressure to do that. To engage that looks simple, but believe me, it is not. And those numbers that Larko referred to are seconds. Three point seven litres a second. So teams working kilos. This temperature affects how much fuel you get. So that's why they're looking at those numbers on that uh, fueling rig. Just listen to Tim Slade there. When he is trying to stop the car at turn nine, the chatter is the rear wheels locking and the drive line basically makes that noise, that chatter noise, as it meshes in the gears. So when he feels that, it's like putting the handbrake on because remember the cars haven't got a diff. The rear wheels do the same speed, both sides, rear, left and rear, left and right. So by the time you get to a point where the rear wheels are locking, it's like the handbrake coming on. The S60 comes in, the Gary Rogers Motorsport crew. Four five. Just take it easy, they know they've got the time with the fuel to go in. Topped up his drink bottle there too. Nice composed stop. Well done. That was a very nice. Uh, it's altering the rear, rear anti roll bar to cope with the additional fuel load. So here's Lowndes. Just coming by the pit there now. Actually, he's out wider. Oh, Jack Perkins here. That's Helmy Marble. Lachlan comes out in front of James Courtney. He's going to have to move it over because Courtney will dive at him. I think he did. Yep. Yes, he did. So when you come out on cold tyres, it's hard to defend. But that's a net gain for Scott McLaughlin because before those stops, he was further back by a long way. Can you remember looking at Slade when McLaughlin was trying to get him? 
Courtney was right up the road. He was four or five seconds in front. So it's a net gain for McLaughlin in that last phase of stops. There aren't too many battle groups developing. They're all spread out. There's only 19 cars on the circuit. So we've lost six. There seems to be space of plenty. I mean, there's all this time for these guys in pit lane at the moment. It's not the mad rush that we've seen. Everything's been staggered. A bit of damage there, Croppo, on the right-hand rear of Slade's. See that? I think you'd be hard-pressed to find a car in the field that doesn't <laughs> fit that category at the moment. Safety car doesn't. Scafe, it was a good pick-up there before, talking about Scotty McLaughlin's stop, just the nice, Croppo. controlled nature of it. When you're sitting in the driving seat during a pit stop, believe me, you get a really good gauge of the tension and the drama happening around you. And if you've got a good car controller or an engineer that can talk to you, keep things settled and you see and feel that way, believe me, if you went and drew a graph of the guys that stall the car, nearly in all occasions it'll be when the drama or the, the voices have been high-pitched on the radio. So good controlled stops, good discipline. 100% like Owen. You can just, when you sense that tension, everybody is affected by it. And you know what it's like, when people do things well, they make it look slow. And that stop of Gary Rogers and the guys on Scott McLaughlin's car was really nicely done. Very high level of composure, as I said before. Here comes Fabian Coulthard. This is a critical stop because he was in that battle group with Slade and McLaughlin prior. dry ice in the passenger side of that car the driver cool suit system Chris Clark see what I mean about space aside from that exit there from uh, Fabian Coulthard with Michael Caruso coming through the lane Lots of air gaps in between cars. Something that we haven't touched on so far that will be noticeable in the cockpits of the car at the moment. They'll be hot and they will be tired. They did two hard races yesterday and they've been through their qualify, uh, qualifying procedures and the shootout for the key 10 earlier today. Right about now, particularly if your car's not bright and shiny in its performance, it will be starting to get physically very, very hard and mentally very hard. Absolutely. This is the gruelling part of the race. In fact, I never used to get the guys to tell me how many laps I've done until I got to 25 laps from the end. Because you just don't want to know. Yeah. I mean, when you tell you lap 20, you say, you're kidding. Adrian Burgess in the Holden Racing Team bunker. Adrian, you've parachuted in here. Things are going well, boys. So far today, holding up pretty well. Uh, yeah, it's not perfect yet, but this is what we need to be doing. We've got JC running a strong third. Tim and Nick um, are doing a good job. GT's had a bit of a tough run while he was in a good position, but look, yeah, we've got a lot of work to do, but my old, uh, my old friends and foes are uh, you know, up the road in front of us, so we've got to gun them down. Adrian, what's been the big focus since you landed in here? What, what do you want to really want to work on with the guys? Oh, we need some car speeds, the first thing. Uh, yeah, look, we just got to uh, we just got to be smarter with what we do with everything on track, off the track. We've got a lot of work to do, but we've got very good people here. They're, everyone's keen, everyone's coming to the party. We need, to, we need to put some speed on the car and uh, give the guys a better piece of equipment to use, and then we've got to make sure we do the right job on the day and, uh, and challenge the others. It sounds like exciting times, Adrian. All the best, mate. It's busy, mate. It's busy. Yeah. It's a good point. When all else fails, make them fast. That's just right. That usually cures a, a range of ills. 100%. So, Wind Cup, still to do that second critical stop, and then we get a sense of where this pans out and what the last segments of the race look like. Yeah, Wind Cup's first stop was on lap 10, so he'll be starting to have a lock on pit lane, and then we'll race it flat out to the end. He leads the way here at the Clipsal 500. Now we're just waiting on fuel, there's a car in the fast lane. Okay, 
Yeah, you'll be clear to go. Make sure the rear wheel starts to spin. Okay, the plane off the Park lane's all clear. Here's a critical moment in this race. The leader, Jamie Winkup, as expected, into pit lane. It's got to be clean. He's got a buffer. But he will know that any mistake here in the lane can cost him dearly. He had about 55 seconds on lounge, so just need to see how long he sits for fuel because it takes around 23 seconds to transit the lane and then you add whatever the stationary time is. Their car control is touching the car. The car control is not allowed to touch the car. The guy at the front of the car in the front left-hand corner of Jamie's car... Well, then, well, he finished taking that fuel out. I'm pretty sure that that's what happened. Let's see where he rejoins. There's Lowndes. There's Lowndes coming up. OK, okay. so he's still got the gap. It's obviously not the buffer that he had. Have a look at that, Crompo. So, wing cup. The field has been cleansed in terms of pit stops. Here's the order. Wing cup over Lowndes. Courtney third. Scott McLaughlin is fourth. Nick Perkat is in fifth. And on exit, oh, he smashed into that tyre bundle. Well, that was, that was what happened earlier. earlier right. so, so that's, that's why he's, they've had to repair the corner. Yeah, so that's the tape. And so car control is at the front with the lollipop stick. He's out of frame at the moment. He comes in. They've got that damage that they wanted to attend to. We heard them calling for that. All looks standard at the moment. Well, that's... Okay, the car controller, room 12.2.2.4, who must not undertake any work at all on a car at any pit stop. That's a violation. Drama, drama, drama. Here we go, let's have another look. Four wheels, fuel going in, windscreen. Strip. I guess the question is, Compo, does that classify as undertaking work on the car? Who knows? This is Tim Schenken, race director. Jason Barguan is in the hot seat as the driving standards observer and the investigating officer this year. It's a big job. Cam McConville's working in the 
Porsche Carrera Cup cars for 2014. This is a good battle here between Courtney and Lowndes, and Courtney's climbed over the top of CL there in that manoeuvre. So it's Wing Cup first, now Courtney second, and Lowndes third, with 28 laps to go. Thermal camera locking on Garth Tander in the pits. Look at the heat generated from those brakes. And that's where the drivers really feel the heat. Pit lane, drive through penalty, car one. Wow. Jamie Winkup. We'll have to go through pit lane and serve a penalty. So you spotted it, Neil. They'll be filthy at Red Bull Racing Australia. That will mean that James Courtney will take the lead of the race. The guys just had discussions going on with Mark Dutton, who was obviously just red hot into this role of uh, team manager, talking to V8 supercar officials about that hands-on incident with the car control. And as you can see, it's a fairly animated discussion. And I can tell you that they'll be debating the interpretation of work on the car. That's exactly what it looks like. Animated. Steve Robertson from Vet Supercar. But he's not. It's, we've got our footage. The footage is there. He's pointing. Fix the car. So the net result will be our race leader. We saw it. He was pointing out. He's the leader of the car. Understand they used to work together as well. So Steve worked at Red Bull Racing. So Mark Dutton, team manager, he'll fight for his corner, clearly. Well, uh, this has continued down a couple of carriages. Uh, Damien White from V8 Supercars is here, and uh, this debate continues. Red Bull are not going to let this go, guys. Damon White saying, not too many in, thanks. Hey, Joe. I can't remember a more 
more dramatic day for quite a while. We've had huge crashes, intense racing. And split hairs in rules. Well, penalties applied, obviously, to Rick Kelly. He did not get in there. He didn't put any effort in. He pointed out, boys, fix this. Get this in. The reason they want the car controller's eyes up is he car controller. They want him at the front of the car to control the traffic that's, that's car to control mind the safety issues. That was the point of discussion just then. I don't know if you can hear it at home. Mark Dutton was saying that's the car control, the controller's job. He has to direct the work to be done on the car and Damon White's response was he has to control the car. So we're in a holding pattern here. It's a Mexican standoff in pit lane. So watch the guy with the lollipop in the front left-hand corner of the car. The issue that will be, is being debated is the touching of the car. And his head's down at that point. And there's an outstanding penalty that has been issued. It's just the slightest margin of error in this sport. Well, what's happened is the stakes have been raised. So there's a lot, there'll be a lot of feeling up and down pit lane about some of the stuff that's gone on today. And let's not forget that when this takes Red Bull out of the lead of the race, it puts their foes at the other end of pit lane, the Holden Racing Team, in the lead of the race. So David Couchy just telling Jamie lane. that he's got no option, he has to pit. And now they want to make sure that he doesn't speed. That's what happened to Rick Kelly when he served his penalty. He got another one off the back of it for going over the speed limit in the lane. Well, Mark Tutton, I know you fought this hard. That just breaks your heart. You, you think you had a fair case? Oh, totally. I mean, obviously the car controller's job is to control the pit stop and to release a safe car and release it safely. He was pointing out work to the guys. Let's not be silly. You cannot repair a car by touching it with that amount of force. That wasn't doing a single thing. Is there anything you can do, or you just got to cop this one? He's, he's just driven through. Then we can't do anything about it. We had to, we had the time to uh, the three laps that he has to serve it. Um, we got knocked back, so uh, play by the rules. Thanks, Dado. Cheers. They're not happy with the rules, but they have to play by it. So that makes Wing Cup now shuffle down to position eight. He will be ropeable inside the cockpit of car one. You can see the furrowed brow when he was entering pit lane. That focus was replaced by just pure frustration. And Mark Dutton in his first weekend as team manager has fought a hard fight. Roland Dane's now taking the fight up to Damian White. And the result is this. James Courtney now leads the race over Craig Lowndes, Scott McLaughlin in third, Nick Perkat and Fabian Coulthard. Then Michael Caruso, Slade, Winkup, Reynolds and Van Gisbergen. Well, here in the Holden Racing Team garage, uh, Adrian Burgess, just watching what's happened there with uh, Team Red Bull. Adrian, your view on the incident you saw there with Team Red Bull and the, the car controller touching the front of the car. Well, uh, yeah, if they're the rules, they're the rules. Uh, yeah. What can I say? I've just got to do my job in here with these guys and if they make mistakes, uh, yeah, you've got to put them under pressure and make the most of it. So, well, this is a long way from being over yet. I'm it does still in this. You're very much in it. James Courtney now takes the race lead, which is nice. Oh, look, it's always nice to be in the lead. I'd rather be doing it on our, on our own merit than other people's mistakes. But look, we'll take it. They want to put them on the table, we'll take it. Thanks, Adrian. Cool. There's still 20 laps to go, and Lowndes will be hunting down James Courtney, who is yet to win a race at the Clipsal 500. Is today the day, a dramatic day in the V8 supercars on seven?
20 left to go, mate. 20 left to go. Temperatures are boiling left, right and centre, up and down pit lane. And now we've got a Holden Racing Team fight against Red Bull Racing Australia with the Volvo of Scott McLaughlin ready to pounce inside the footwell of James Courtney. Seen having a safety tap there of the, the brake just before he had the big stop down at turn nine. That's the hottest stop on the circuit. So he just has a security tap to make sure it's there with his left foot. This is round behind the old pit area, turn 11. Now a little hesitant throttle through 13. He just fans the throttle a bit there, squeezes it then, and then another big stop. Okay, 4.6 free bar, 4.6 bar. You have one curb pop, Lounge has two. Rob Star on the radio. Let's crank it up and have a, a look and a listen at this one. It'll be an enjoyable ride. circuit from our race leader who's 0.8 of a second so that's the gap back to Craig Lowndes and Scott McLaughlin at the top three McLaughlin's got the fresher tyres he came in on lap 43 Courtney came in on 42 and Lowndes was in on lap 39 so there's not much in it but every little bit helps so there's Van Gisberg and remember he got pinged he's trying to climb his way back up into the top 10 he's ninth behind him was David Reynolds Russell Ingalls out of sequence, so David Wall is 11th. And looking back to Tim Slade, so we're on board now with Jamie Winkup. He's in 7th. Wow, how exciting is this day? It's been so hectic. 
Paddock in pit lane. I just needed to come up to the V8 Supercars Paddock Club just to take a breath and I bump into this guy, Dave Hughes Hughes. How are you enjoying the Clipsal 500? It's absolutely mad. Do these guys realise it's round one of the series? They're going to run out of cars by round three. <laughs> I'm loving it. Now, you're, you're in Adelaide because at the moment you're in the middle or you've just started your tour. You're over at the Fringe Festival. You have to deal with this noise. Every night we have to deal with this. It's um, trying to do jokes while people are going to 300k an hour. Still, it's, um, I'm even closer now, though. I'm trying to do an interview right on the track. It's good fun. <laughs> Another, few, another couple of weeks and then you're heading off around the country. Where can people find out about your tour and get tickets? Uh, DaveHughes.com.au I believe but yeah, just Google me and I'll be at every racetrack. I love it. Come on. Rick Kelly's my man. 15th not good enough, Rick. Come on. Get up there. See, if you want to be here and enjoy all the fun, you can head to V8Supercars.com to get yourself in the paddy club and enjoy all the action with Husey. Send, send Husey up to the commentary box. Hey, Lee Holdsworth has just done the fastest lap of the race. 121.65 for the Mercedes-Benz. James Courtney has just been pinged for curb, hopping again. So he's got two strikes next to his name. Back down here at turn nine, Jamie Winkup trying to salvage his day and he makes contact with Michael Caruso. Winkup into the side of Caruso, the Norton's gone and so too is Winkup. That's all busted up at the front and Jamie Winkup could be a DNF here. The heads drop at Red Bull Racing Australia. He served that penalty. They're not happy about it. He was trying to pick his way through the field and look at the damage to the front left. What a disaster. And that's what's happened when he's ended up back in the pack there and he's had a lunge down at turn nine at Michael Caruso. It's under investigation as well. So even those cards may fall against him. So he's crept back on the grass as we saw Todd Kelly do earlier in the weekend just to stay out of the way. Here it is from above, from a long way out. 
Oh, he got a long way down, but lost the rear end in the process. So that's what did it. Actually got far enough up, but wasn't in control in the last part of it. And it's hurt Caruso's car there. You can see the damage. Michael couldn't drive it up to the next corner. So he's in the pit. As a consequence. Bang. And Lee Holdsworth uh, is out of lives on the curb hopping as well. I know he's quite a number of laps down at this stage, but look at the amount of wheel work that's going on there to try and gather all that back up. So here it is again from the other side. You don't see the car one sliding quite so much, but it's busted right rear, right rear. on uh, Michael's car, and it's steering from the rear as a result. Busted a toe link or something. Uh, just hearing there's a problem with the Volvo. It's dropped back out. There it is. Well, Scott McLaughlin was in third, and he's now he's sliding further down, and that means that Nick Perkat goes up to third. So he was running for another podium spot. Nick's been doing a really solid job in this racing car number triple two, Barretts. Uh, Jamie Wincup, this has turned into one very tough day at the office. Yeah, hey, first and foremost, big apology to, to Michael. I uh, come in all out of control, uh, trying to push hard to, to get some positions back after the pit lane penalty. So uh, big, uh, big apology to him and his crew. Um, and yeah, that's all I got. All right, Jamie, thank you, mate. Thank you. This will trigger the safety car if that car can't be restarted, and I suspect it can't. It's really disappointing he's having such a great run. 67 laps of 78. He's just exhausted. Absolutely spent. Oh, this her cat this now Fabian Coulthard's going for podium position. For position, correct. So, and until the safety car is declared, they've got to stay on it. So those yellow flags out there now. So we'll take a break while the Petters Chrysler safety car goes out and sorts out this field. Courtney's still the leader. Tiny margin over Lowndes. Rapidly running out of cars here. Started with a field of 25, and what have we got now? We've got 12, 13 cars. 
left at this stage. Yeah, Matty, and Michael Caruso still sitting in his car. So that contact with Wink Cup, although it didn't look like much, it was severe enough to belt this rear tyre, which bent the track rod or tow link, whatever you want to call it, which allows you to wheel along the rear of the car. Here, there's one lying on the ground. I'll just grab it here so I can show it to you. That's what we're talking about. And they're pre-set to length. The guys pre-do that with wheel alignment so they can whack them in about three minutes. The problem was where it fixes to the outer upright there, it's bent the pin, so locating it has been very, very difficult. So it's a, a, a much longer repair than what would normally be the case. A lot of the force went right into the wheel, Larco. So as Jamie arrived sideways, it was sort of wheel to wheel, bang, against the right rear of Michael's car and... That's why uh, it would have bent that pin because it was uh, fairly sideways when Jamie arrived. So as this is bunched up, very interesting because Courtney and Lowndes were the two fastest cars, but Perkett has done a great job. Fabian Coulthard, just before the safety car, was right up behind Nick Perkett. Slade probably doesn't look like he's got quite the pace. Van Gisbergen sixth. Dave Reynolds also battling for pace. David Wall, James Moffat and Dar Wood. That's your top ten. Yeah, so there's uh, only 12, 12 cars, cars on the lead lap at the moment. Rick Kelly's 12th. And uh, walking wounded after that. Adrian Burgess and Blake Smith, they work together at Dick Johnson Racing in the Courtney Championship year on screen there at the moment. Could be a big result for an Adelaide boy here for Nick Perkat in third position. In the series now, full time, having done extremely well in the Dunlop series, Carrera Cup. Remember that uh, Nick stepped in for James Courtney injured last year after Phillip Island. He ran at Sydney Olympic Park at the final event. Great shot there of. James looking back at Craig Lowndes. He heard Rob Starr say between 50 and 60k all the way to the A to Z sign. Given the controversy about that today, he will ensure there's a speed readout right in front of him on his dash. So now there's no weaving. They're all directly in line. You watch them pop out of the line when Courtney gets to the acceleration zone. That's the AZ squares on the fence. Right to about now. One. Go, 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 go. Courtney peels away. Percat covers Coulthard. It's going to be a mad dash to the finish. And, and it's going to be brutal at the front because Courtney and Lowndes are going to play hardball here for sure. So is Van Gisbergen. So is Coulthard because he speeds good. Got to look at the curb hops because Coulthard hasn't got a curb hop at all. Courtney and Lowndes have both got two. Van Gisbergen up to fifth now. Right in behind Fabian Coulthard. So the pressure will be on the Adelaide boy, Nick Perkat, to hold Fabian behind. And the pressure's on Craig Lowndes to have a dive at James Courtney. Early laps like this is the time to do it because tyres are relatively cold at the restart and Van Gisbergen straight down the inside of Fabian. Good pass. Serious recovery for him given the pit lane penalty earlier. So Courtney yet to win a race at the Clipsal 500. Lowndes now a six-time race winner at this circuit. Percat. First full-time season. We know he's already got a Bathurst title under his belt. Van Gisbergen. Pulling it back after a disaster penalty. That car that Nick Perkat's driving oh. is the car that Tony Delberto had last year. And how loose are these blokes over the top of the kerb there? Well, he tried to do it because he knew that was his last kerb hop for Courtney. He was going to go over, straight over the kerb, and he kept on turning it. And Perkat just got one as well. So now the top three are all on two strikes. A one more and a bad sportsmanship flag, and after that they do a pick tour. But this is going to be a riveting end. They've got a margin over the third place, and it's a long way from done here. And how's that for an explosive pack? You've got Nick Perkat in his rookie year in the main game. 
Shane Van Gisbergen, Fabian Coulthard, and Tim Slade's not far out of this. There's another South Australian. That'll get him up in the stands here as well. Hercat covers and Van Gisbergen's going to try and sneak around the outside to try and get the line for the next one, but he can't expose too much because Coulthard will snatch a spot. Van Gisbergen's very good at this next section, Neil. Up and over the kerb at the second last corner. He's a little bit too far back this time, but he's pace in this section right here. That's the spot that Shane's got to focus on to be able to get that manoeuvre done five, and five, down five, the inside of Nick Perkett. On board now with Slade. Oh, 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 oh. Shane Van Gisbergen must have been just fractions away from breaching over the top of the curb there. All oh, over this Nick's gone. in trouble. I don't know that he'll stop. He's run wide. Gizzy's up on the outside as they make the run to five. If he can sneak a, a little further along, he'll have track position. He didn't get it done. Rick Kelly's in here as well. How's that for a train of horsepower and aggravation? So it's Percat, the South Australian, Van Gisberg and the Kiwi. Another Kiwi behind him in Coulthard. Another local boy in Tim Slade behind oh, him. Oh, in the wall oh, for Percat! Perkat has gone into the wall front left. He's made a critical mistake, unfortunately, under pressure. And he's off down the escape road at nine. What a shame. Out of third position. Okay, Mick, we've seen that. We've seen that. Talk to me. That's Alex Somerset. Talking to Nick Perkat. Sorry. Now, he may be far enough down the road that the race director doesn't intervene in terms of safety car intervention. Maybe, maybe. It's a pretty dangerous spot, so... The other thing at play here, boys, we are now time certain. We've got a countdown clock on your screen. So Van Gisbergen goes to third. Pipsal 500 winner 2013. He's got clear air. He's only four seconds away from these leaders. Look at Kelly, out of control, dancing on the rear. Break up the inside of Slade, done. That was a massive move from Rick Kelly riding the bumps. The car was teetering on the edge of disaster and he got that slot. He goes up to fifth. He would have felt like he was totally out of control and that was only, That's why his heart rate's there. <laughs> Those guys have... That's been an incredible fight back. Van Gisbergen up to third, Rick Kelly up to fifth after oh, both drive through He's Lounds almost in the fence at turn eight. Lounds is throwing everything at this. It's a half a second on the computer timing at the moment. Courtney fighting to claw this race team back to the top and Lowndes throwing everything he's got. The last time he was a Clipsal 500 winner was 1999. And James has had quite a check in past here in the early days when he first got involved in V8 supercar racing. This was a real bogey location for him. Two solid top 10 results for him last year. Building on it now. He's in a real arm wrestle with Lowndes. He started from 15th on the grid, Courtney. Remember, he's now got Adrian Burgess, the man that they took out of Red Bull Racing and put in the Holden Racing team. The last time they all worked together in 2010, James Courtney went on to win the championship. There's aggro between these two teams. And there's pure fight out on the circuit. That was a big hit for Nick Perkett and a real disappointing finish. You can see the distraught eyes of the team owner, Ryan Walkinshaw. And that's another part of the steep learning curve for the youngster who was doing a terrific job. He started 13th and he was staring down a podium spot. Supported by James Rosenberg, who's backed many drivers over a long period of time from South Australia, going all the way back to Mark Poole. Look at this. Great battle down here at Turn 9. Lounds ranging in close up once again. You can see real differences in the behaviour of their cars here, and that's Mark Winterbottom, bad sportsmanship flag for three breaches on the kerb. He's 12th at the moment. When you claim the Sunday race win at the Clipsal 500, you're also crowned the overall Clipsal champion. It's a real badge of honour in V8 supercars. Here we go. Courtney. Using all of his nows to hold off. And I don't think Van Gisbergen's got enough to be able to breach this margin. 
but still four seconds to the leader, three and a half to second place. But this is unresolved at the moment. Rick Kelly on the outside now of Fabian Coulthard at turn four. So only two laps to go, guys. And the pressure now that Kelly is applying to the back of Fabian. So the clock is counted down to zero. We get one more full lap after this. Courtney's on three hops, so it'll be a bad sportsmanship for him. But it doesn't really matter at this point what they wave at him. He's going to fight like crazy. He's got a margin. How berserk was that? Absolutely threw that thing at turn eight and managed to get out the other side. Look at this. Kelly. So they're arguing for fourth. How's Mechanical the black flag car 18, Jack Perkins. How is the comeback from Shane Van Gisbergen? Sent through pit lane, middle of the race. And Rick Kelly. Both and Rick Kelly. Really good, very, very good run. And here they are, fighting at the end. Van Gisbergen currently on the podium position. 3.22 kilometres to go. Courtney, Holden Racing Team versus Lowndes, Red Bull Racing Australia. Van Gisbergen trying to hold on to a podium finish. This is it. The Clipsal 500 crown is at stake right here. So 10 turns remaining to resolve the question of the Glipsal 500 champion for 2014. Lowndes has been a specialist on occasion down at turn nine. Does he have enough pace? This is the one, turn seven. Last time around, Courtney threw the whole lot at turn eight. Where you are millimetres away from catastrophe. What does he do this time around? He's just got to get through clearly, oh. but Jack Perkins. So there's traffic on... The oh, clips the wall. Got Lounds away with it. Into the concrete. Where on earth did that car come from? They managed to both get around it. But that has cost Craig Lowndes, and that's put James Courtney in the box seat. Just a couple of turns to go. The last time we saw him in 2013, he was all busted up in Phillip Island. He comes back with effectively a brand new car. And the rivalry between the Holden Racing Team and Red Bull Racing Australia, it's on! Courtney gets the win. Loud second. Van Gisbergen third. Thank you for all the... Logging out as you boys have been over Christmas. It was... Burgess, you guys run well. I'm sure you've enjoyed some great victories, but this has got to be one of the best. Well done. Mate, that's just... Uh, the last two months have been absolutely crazy. I can't thank everybody, Ryan, Martin, and the whole guys. Awesome. This is what we've got coming, guys. Get ready for it. Good news for Holden fans. Ryan, congratulations. I know you guys have put so much effort and work in, and here's the payback. Yeah, look, it's been a lot of hard work, as, uh, as ATB just said, but bringing him and Matty on, and uh, obviously it's rejuvenated the whole squad, and uh, hopefully this is a sign of things to come. Winning is good. It's very fucking good. <laughs> Don't smell TV. James Courtney. Go, go. He's going to... Burn some rubber up here at uh, the top of the circuit, up at turn seven. And that's a great fight back. They made the changes. They've declared their intentions. They want to get back to the top. The Holden Racing Team's back in town. James' his wife, Karis. <laughs> you may not have any tyres. That would be an understatement. So Rick Kelly had a great battle at the closing laps there with Fabian as well. It ended up in favour of Fabian in fourth. Rick Kelly in fifth on fresher tyres. He stopped on lap 67. They had good pace at the end there. How did Lowndes survive that wall scrape at turn eight and live to tell the tale? You've got to feel sorry for Nick Perkat, who was going very well. He was shaping up for a podium and a little mistake at one of the most dangerous corners one of the wildest spots this is Lowndes so Jack Perkins just appears out of nowhere and Lowndes just caught too shallow yeah on the way in <laughs> wow he's a maniac isn't he don't know how much he enjoyed it but uh, congratulations James Courtney I mean now, that was a big injury that he suffered, a big hit at Phillip Island. 
and a great fight back. You know, what you said before, Matt, to start 15th and win this race, done a very, very good job. You know where to go. Straight down, mate. Straight Thoroughly down. deserved. The interesting thing between the Holden Racing Team crew and the Red Bull crew, they've been separated by a distance in pit lane, but now they're going to be side by side up here at the end because car 22 finds the number one slot. Adrian Raskin there from HRT, just congratulating James. Here we go. He's got the guns out and Frank the Tank is back in business. Said before, it's a badge of honor, this one, the Clipsal 500, because of so many reasons. It's the toughest way you can start the season. You can fight your way through 500 Ks across two days and finish on top. You've shown your medal in this game. We know that James Courtney's done everything there is to do in this sport pretty much. He's won a championship, but now he's got a race victory and a Clipsal 500 crown as courtesy of being the Sunday race winner next to his name. Well, James Courtney, this is the chat that we've waited a long time to have. Congratulations, mate. That was a fantastic run and holding off Woo! one of the greats of all time, Craig Lowndes. That was some final sprint to the line. Well done. Yeah, it's a bit of hard work there. Uh, we had really good car pace. We knew this morning the car was good. Qualifying didn't work out well for us, but uh, man, it feels good after all the stuff that's gone on, Barrett. <laughs> Everyone home knows they've been on the journey and to, uh, to come here reward the guys after putting you know, the ridiculous hours those guys put in over Christmas. I can't thank their families and enough for letting them come and work for the team and put in all those hours, but uh, amazing effort. Adelaide, Holden victory, it has to happen. <laughs> We've well, thrown down the challenge for the year. Well done, James Courtney. Cheers. So, thanks, everyone at home. Enjoy the podium. Well, Craig Lowndes once again up there fighting all the way. Lowndes, did you, did you see a chance to get past James Courtney at all there? Uh, not in the end, no. I think in the middle part there, we, uh, we were looking after fuel and you know, he got by me and, uh, and of course then our fuel numbers got better and we started to attack, but he had good pace and it's congratulations to all those guys at HRT, obviously done a really good job today, but uh, you know, thankfully we, we got another good uh, podium today and it's good for the championship. It's great for the championship, you go away the bag of points and lead in the championship, Lowndes, well done. Thanks Barrett. And Shane Van Gisberg and another fighting performance for you, it's been a fantastic weekend, great way to start the year. Yeah, we had some good speed and some good battles there, but a little confused as to why we got the drive through, but I guess I just crept forward, I, I don't know, but... If it was my fault, it's my fault, I'll accept it. But um, yeah, great to be back on the podium. We had really good speed and pretty fun race there. Did the penalty really fire you up? Oh yeah, I was pretty angry about it, but you know, if it was my own, own fault, whatever. But um, I actually feel sorry for Nick Perkett. He was doing a great job in third and holding me off actually. He might've held it together and he just made a mistake. So um, sucks for him at his home race, but uh, we'll take it. Jump up there and enjoy that podium, Shane. Well done. Awesome, thanks a lot. Yeah, that was it. Incredible fight back for Shane Van Gisbergen. Makes you wonder what might have been had not that penalty been handed out. So Holden, one, two, three, four. Rick Kelly, same uh, in the same boat as Van Gisbergen, pushing his way back through the field. So he's the leading Nissan. James Moffat also in there as well. Dale Wood finishes in 10th spot. Davey Reynolds was the best of the Ford guys. Jack Perkins, we saw him trundling around at the end. So you go down to 17th to find those on the board. Jamie Winkup finishing in 15th and then a whole stack of DNFs for various reasons, but mostly because of the concrete barriers. This was an extraordinary race featuring all types of controversy, oh. amazing crashes. Watch this one from Will Davis and a little touch from James Moffat. That's all it takes. And then the Erebus... Mercedes is just ripped to shreds down the left-hand side. And that was the beginning of mayhem. It certainly was. Then on the restart, this happened. Jason Bright, Team BOC, coming around turn one, gets flipped over. Watch this. Pirouettes into the air. One and a half ton, virtually, of V8 supercar thrown around like a rag doll. He's never had a rollover in his long career now he knows what it's like to feel the full force. There was damage everywhere because of that. And then another restart. They'll be controversial. You'll be reading about them throughout the week. And so too this. The car controller deemed to be touching the car. And the penalty is a black flag. A pit lane drive-through.
They were furious about that. There's conjecture about touching, working on the car. What does it really mean? The result was that Jamie Winkup ended up having to fight back himself. He would have contact. And then this was such heartbreak for Nick Perkat, the local boy, into the fence. And then Craig Lowndes into the fence on the last lap as well. But an outstanding drive from James Courtney and from Lowndes and from all of those left on the lead lap, really. No doubt. It was a battle of survival. 